on Instagram and I click on your name, mm -hmm. this pops up. Christian sexuality is recommended. Like all kinds of topics on Christian sexuality are recommended to me. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, this guy, I mean, he's, you're almost like epitomizing the conversation on <laughs> Christian sexuality. So I'm like, yeah. I want to talk to him. Um, and I kind of, yeah. yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background of why this is interesting yeah. to me. Um, I was reading this book by Leonard Sweet mm -hmm. uh, probably a couple years ago. Super good book. It's called uh, The Rings of Fire. And he kind of lays out just kind of like what the future is going to look like for Christians. Mm -hmm. And sexuality is one of the volcanoes that he names that. This mm. is going to be a big topic. And one of the things I want to do with Christian podcasts, I want it to be a source of conversation mm -hmm. for the church globally. And I think... I think this conversation needs to be addressed, uh, mm -hmm. no, human sexuality. And I think, you know, specifically like on today's topic, you have a brand new book that I was listening to because it's my first time ever also that I had an audible um, <laughs> book. So it's interesting because now I wasn't reading it. I was listening to it. So yeah. for people that are unfamiliar with audible, it's so good. It's just like listening to a podcast times yeah. five <laughs> <laughs> at least this one it's a uh, no an hour long podcast but uh <laughs> so good to like listen to it and like the ideas and thoughts i'm like oh this is good so i think i'm gonna do more yeah. audio from now on um but anyways that's my yeah. experience and i feel like your book is entitled embodied so mm -hmm. we want to talk about a little bit about that but if you're ready you know why why don't you introduce yourself sure uh, unless you want to say something you know before we start or no, whatever yeah no not at all yeah that book uh embodied the subtitle is transgender identities the church and what the bible has to say so the the, the title um i like to give uh somewhat vague or provocative titles and then the subtitles of my book typically gives more clarity on what the book's actually about um because embodied that can mean many different things in fact i if you go on amazon there's several books with that title that have nothing to do with the topic that i address but Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm uh, the president of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. So that's been my full time job for uh, over four years now. Is uh, helping Christian leaders and churches uh, engage questions about faith, sexuality, and gender, specifically LGBTQ related questions, uh, to engage those questions with uh, theological faithfulness and courageous love. So grace and truth, um, theological depth, and also pastoral care. Uh, deep thinking, wide love, um, and uh, I, I think in the past we have we we typically have done one of those things better than the other. Like we've had an airplane with one wing, you know, and and wow. an airplane with one wing doesn't fly very far. And so I'm trying to help us understand that we we need both wings. We need to hold to a robust countercultural um counterintuitive christian sexual ethic um and and, and yet and yet <laughs> and also um love people um incredibly well who fall short of that standard which includes every single one of us so um yeah that that's what i do full time uh, before that i was a college professor at a number of at uh, three different schools uh nottingham university just a brief stint at nottingham um, it's just, it's so cool to say you taught at Nottingham that I always include that, even though I was only there for a temporary <laughs> post. But uh, then I taught at uh, a conservative uh, Baptist, well, the background was Baptist, a school called Cedarville University. And then I taught at uh, Eternity Bible College, which was a Bible college started by Francis Chan um, mm -hmm. and ended there in, in 2016. And that's right when I started the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. So uh, love to write, love to read. Uh, love life, <laughs> love Jesus. Hopefully, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes that's tough. <laughs> uh, so good, man. Well, Preston Sprinkle, because I didn't say his name, um, <laughs> is on the show today. He's got a brand new book, Embodied. What is the subtitle of the book? Sorry, I don't have it right in front of me. No, it's fine. It's called uh, Transgender Identities: The Church and What the Bible Has to Say. Mm -hmm. Transgender Identities: The Church and What the Bible Has to Say, and you're the author of a previous book called um, A People to Be Loved, right? 
Yep. Yep. Why, so, uh, subtitle why homosexuality is not just an issue. So, so that book mm. came out in 2015 and that dealt with kind of the LGB and the Bible. And then this book deals with the T of, of the acronym, um, which, which some people think they're kind of the same thing, but they're actually incredibly different. Like it, you know, I had to do several years of research for each book and there's about a 1% overlap in content between these two book so they the, the the lgb and the t are really two different uh and there's some similarities but they're very different conversations and so yeah um sometimes the acronym we you know people throw around lgbt lgbtq lgbtq plus lgbtqia you know and i think sometimes the acronym um can be unhelpful in in it, it for it kind of uh, <laughs> in a really unhelpful way, we, we end up collapsing these so many different kind of concepts together under one identity. And, and one of the things I want to do is kind of unravel this acronym a bit and, and, and ask more specific questions about sexuality and gender. Wow. So good. Yeah. I think for me, particularly, um, I'm kind of, uh, I mean, I am new to this topic other than, you know, I have a few friends who identify as either mm -hmm. gay, you know, LGBT or, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever of these cases, but, to the actual conversation, I'm brand new, man. And even as I was uh, listening to the book, some of the terms, I'm like, mm -hmm. whoa, like, I mean, I could almost like gotten lost into like all the terminology. And uh, you even said in your book, like you, you want to help people to think theologically and scientifically about human nature. And then you said you went into a few scholarly disciplines uh, to write the book, things like neuroscience, mm -hmm theological anthropology, endocrinology, gender theory, and clinical psychology. I mean, and this is just a few of the stuff you talk about, right? And just from the get-go, it sounds like, man, what are these guys going to talk about? Um, what is helpful to introduce people to this topic? Yeah, um, and by the way, I, 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 my internet can be a little glitchy, so I apologize if it's a little choppy here. Um, yeah, you know, the um, w one of the themes that run through the book is that this topic involves a lot of deep thinking about a lot of different academic disciplines. Um, and then that might appeal to kind of the, you know, the kind of the nerds among us, the, the, the eggheads, the introverts who like to read books and, you know, get into theological debates maybe. Um, and I think there's a place for that. And, and then this topic, it just, you can't get around the fact that it involves a lot of theology, a lot of science, a lot of philosophy, um, all kinds of stuff that we need to think well about, but also our, our ultimate goal as Christians for thinking deeply about whatever is to love people better, right? Love people more precisely. So we, I, I, I've never understood this, um, this dichotomy that some people assume, you know, that exists between the heart and the mind, you know, like, you know, I, I, when I was in seminary, I would hear, you know, Oh, if you study too much, you know, you're going to lose your heart for people. I'm like, what, in what, in what world that God's created is it, should it be true that <laughs> the more you study his word, the less you're going to love people. Well, when you're the word, the very word is about God's great love for people. So I, I, I'm not denying that some that that happens to some people, but I don't think it should. I don't think we should be scared of thinking too deeply. Um, I think we should think very deeply and also love very widely. And so that's, those are the two kind of underlying strands in, in the book is I interact with a lot of complex topics. Hopefully I do so in a way that's understandable. I, I try not to make it a, a scholarly book. Um, but also, you know, as you know, as you, if you're listening to it, you know, I weave stories in and out of the book so that we never lose sight of the fact that we are talking about a real, uh, diverse group of beautiful people created in God's image. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the feel, the feel of the book. Yeah. Yeah. I love the, the part where this is about real people. This is not just a topic or no, this is people, you know, behind all these concepts, there's actual mm -hmm. people struggling with, or, or, or not struggling, but I mean, yeah. either or, um, but it's just real people living a real life, right? And mm -hmm. what is, I mean, just, I, I mean, I kind of know the, I, I, I listened to the book, but for people that just don't have any concept, like why do we need to talk about transgender 
um, who are wh how yeah. do we define who is a transgender? How is that different even from from just oh I'm gay or or homosexual? Or, uh, what's a little yeah. bit of uh, going into the terms like why transgender? Yeah. So so the, well th those are two two really important questions. Why should we address this topic? Why should Christians think about it? And then what is it we're even kind of thinking about? The, you know, the first one why we should think about it partly because it's kind of everywhere in society right now. <laughs> so, I mean, um, there's lots of questions being raised from, from politics to in, in broader culture on, in entertainment and music. Um, uh, and also we have people, many more people in our churches who might be wrestling with their own gender identity. And we can maybe define that in a second. Um, a lot of people wrestle with uh, who they are um, and they don't feel really safe to wrestle out loud or to get help from the church. So um, even though, yes, it's a, it's a small percentage of the human population that would identify as trans that should never discourage Christians from thinking about it. I mean, again, we follow a savior who left the 99 to pursue the one who had a special heart for those who are marginalized, those who were othered, those who were, um, outcasted by society, especially religious, the, you know, the religious among us. So um, I, I do think the trans population does fit that kind of profile. I think if Jesus were here today, he would have uh, more trans friends, not fewer trans friends. So, um, but yeah, the, the trans conversation, so you have trans people that Christians should reach out, get to know, obviously, um, but also the trans conversation raises some fundamental questions about human nature um, that are pertinent to everybody, really. I mean, you could take, for instance, the whole question of trans people in sports. This is a particularly hot button issue. Should a biological male who identifies as female play in fe typically female only sports, you know, and that, well, that raises all kinds of maybe people listening are going to want to jump in with a yes or no, or, you know, well, hold on a second. Let's do you, how well do you understand human nature and biology and testosterone and <clears throat> prenatal hormone exposure in the womb? You know, and if you don't know what half the stuff means, then, then you, we need to understand these things so we can have a more responsible and thoughtful um, answer to this question. What does it mean to be male and female? How much overlap is there? How much difference is there? Um, what is, what does woman mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, I mean, so English is your second language, right? Yes. Okay. So, so the terms man and woman, I mean, these are going to be probably the first maybe 50 English words you're being exposed to. These are really basic, basic English terms. And yet mm -hmm. we live in a society today where I think people wouldn't even know how to define that. For instance, is, is Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala, Kam Kamala, Kamala, I think. Um, My pastor says Camila, but Camila. <laughs> I say it's not Camila, man. It's Kamala. <laughs> Kamala, Kamala. I'm going to stick with Kamala. Uh, um, is, is Kamala the first female vice president in America because she is or because she identifies as a female? Like is female primarily a, an identity that somebody chooses for themselves or is it a... a an objective state of existence that is determined for you apart from your subjective choice. Like those are, um, I think a lot, that's a big debate right now in society. Uh, so we're dealing, so again, I don't want to get too far off the rails here, but um, we're dealing that the trans conversation has sort of unearthed a lot of other um, questions about what it even means to be human. So that, that's point number yeah. one. I think this, this conversation is important for anybody, any Christian in particular to interact with. Um, what does it mean to be trans? Well, you know, that's, um, that's chapter, uh, what is it? Two or three of my book where I spend a whole chapter kind of looking at the diversity of trans. Um, Mark Yarhouse is a Christian psychologist and he likes to say, you know, if you've met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. Like there's such a wide diversity of what it even means to be trans. Um, and let me just give you two polar ends of that spectrum of perspectives uh, on one polar end somebody you know some people say you need to be diagnosed with a psychological condition called gender dysphoria like 
this is if you're if you've been clinically diagnosed with gender dysphoria then you are truly trans that's you're the real trans person on the other side of the spectrum somebody might say well i don't need some medical professional gatekeeper to tell me i'm trans if i'm trans if i say i'm trans then i'm trans and so they might on this other end of the spectrum they kind of push back on this medical criteria for determining whether you're trans or not. And that's just with trans. I mean, there's all kinds of other categories under underneath trans, like non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, and, and many others, uh, demigender and, and so on, that I think a lot of people don't even know what these terms even mean. Um, so yeah, there, so I, I honestly, I can't even give a short answer to what it means to be trans. All I can do is alert you and the audience to the fact that, that that's a huge debate right now on mm-hmm. what it even means to be uh, trans. So, um, yeah, yeah, we're jumping right into it, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we are, man. It, I, I think it's super helpful that uh, that phrase you said, you know, when you met one trans people, you've met one trans people, right? Like, I, you, mm. you can't really uh, generalize, okay, this is what it is. It's No, that's one case, and the next case might look totally different. Uh, I think also another really helpful uh, uh, conversation to kind of like understand this better is the difference. And, and I mean, you mentioned it in the in the audio book. <laughs> you mm-hmm. mentioned it used to be so easy to say, man, you have a penis, you have a vagina, mm-hmm. right? You're you're a boy or you're a girl. Like your your physical sexuality mm-hmm. represented your your identity right your your mm-hmm. your sexual identity but now or your gender identity and i think now there's at least from society there's a difference between the two right i mean you could yeah. be born male that doesn't necessarily mean your gender is male now some people might say what you know yeah. of course it is right <laughs> but but I mean, is this a social construct? Is this like what you're saying at the beginning? Uh, society right now is, is kind of like we're figuring it out who we are. Is this science? Is this uh, one yeah. side of the, you know, are we on the on the one side of the spectrum or this other side of the spectrum? It's almost like the pendulum swinging. Yeah. Um, it, why do we have this, right? Why do we have this difference between sex and gender? Why, yeah. why is that difference? Well, that's that's uh, it's important to recognize exactly that that for many parts of society, uh, people make a distinction between sex and gender. Um, so, sex is your biological sex, whether you're male or female, and that's something. Except for the small percentage of people that might have a intersex condition, where there's some uh, ambiguity in in their biological sex. Um, you know, 99.99% of people are either male or female. That, that's just a biological fact. Um, in fact, a hundred years after you're dead, people can dig up your bones and they can still tell whether you are male or female. This is etched into the basic coding of what it means to be human. That's sex. Now, up until the 1970s, people would also say gender to refer to that reality. Well, since then, um, in most um, academic circles, but even now, it's 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 widespread in culture to make a distinction between sex and gender. Sex again is your biological sex. Gender is uh, some people define it as your your psychological or cultural aspects of being male or female. So, for instance, your your psychological aspects, your gender identity is kind of your internal sense of who you are. Now that. Again, all I'm doing is defining how these words are used. I'm not saying these are really helpful um, concepts. I'm just saying these are the concepts that most people are wrestling with. So your gender identity, your internal sense of who you are. And then you have this other thing called like gender roles, like your expectation. Like if you're a male, there's certain societal expectations of how you should act. So for instance, in, um, uh, in, in, uh, American culture, um, you know, if you are a man and you are married to a woman, um, society would sort of expect you to be the breadwinner, to go to work, you know, and um, if you were a a stay at home dad, you know, and you raise the kids and your wife was off at work, um, many people in society would be inter like they, they would not like that wouldn't be the expectation people like that would be a little atypical. 
um, again, I'm not saying it's wrong or not. I'm not even saying people would say it's wrong. I'm just saying that that'd be a little bit like, oh, whoa, that's not what I would expect when I met, um, you know, a husband and wife. So you have these concepts like masculinity and femininity, these sort of cultural assumptions about what it means for a man and woman, a man and woman to exist in society. Well, that's, that's, that's kind of these, um, yeah, gender roles, you know? And so when people say that gender is a social construct and some people kind of don't like that phrase, but there's a good deal of truth to that. Like, you know, the fact that we would as a society, um, as you know, um, have certain assumptions about what it means to be masculine or feminine. That is by definition constructed partly by society. So a social construct, um, or the classic example is, you know, the, the color is pink and blue. If I was, if I were to ask my audience is pink, a feminine color or masculine color, everybody's going to say, well, pink is a feminine yeah. color. That's why we that have gender reveals. What's that? <laughs> We have gender reveals pink gender and blue. Gender reveals exactly, yeah. And that <laughs> but that is the essence of a social construct because a hundred years ago, some people don't know this, pink was considered masculine and blue was feminine. If you had a pink a hundred years ago, if you had a if you if you had a daughter, you would put her in a blue, maybe dress or something. And if you had a son, pink was the masculine color. That just I mean, that's a kind of an obvious example that these things that we associate with femininity and masculinity are in part constructed or influenced by society. So all, all that to say, when you enter into the trans conversation, understanding the difference between sex and gender are really important. So when people say, ask the question, how many genders are there? And it, my audience right now, as I ask that question, don't answer it. You cannot answer it until you, you ask a question. Your question should be, what do you mean by gender? Because if gender is defined as your internal sense of self, how many internal senses of self are there in the world? I don't, seven billion? I don't know. I mean, it's like <laughs> when people are defining gender in such, I, I would say, subjective and, and kind of uh, nebulous ways, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right. I'm just saying that is what it is. That can add confusion to the conversation when, when other people are thinking sex when they hear gender, you know? And then... Yeah. What do you mean there's all these genders? There's only two. It's like, well, there's two sexes, but how many genders are there? Well, we got to ask the question, what do you mean by gender? Because right now that is that term is used 11 different ways by 10 different people. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the point is not really to understand why, even though, I mean, that you talk about no ontological and just a bunch of stuff, right? Psychological and, uh, <laughs> but it's just the reality today. Right. We, I mean, on another episode, maybe we'll talk about maybe the whys or where is that coming from or what caused that. Um, it's going to be super hard and that's a whole topic in itself. But I think that's really helpful to understand that in this cultural moment, there is a distinction whether we, we see it or not. Um, and whether, right, I, I think that's super helpful when you say, what is gender? That, that should be, why do you mean when you say gender, right? And for example, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's, it's, we're going to see it more and more, right? Mm -hmm. But when we, when we have to like push the dot of we're male or female on non-binary mm -hmm. or other or don't want to identify, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, just culture itself, it's creating these spaces, maybe for inclusion, maybe for saying, oh, oh there's, there's other people that don't, don't identify or can be categorized under these. Let's create this. So that's just the reality. Why mm. are you, you know, why, why do you say to people that, that maybe question you, like, what does this, I mean, and this is because I, I I've heard it on your book, right? But, um, that's the reason why I know I can say this, but why is this man who is, uh, you know, I, I almost, I even forgot the word for not homosexual. <laughs> Tr trans or, uh, no, like the, the, the word for a guy that likes a woman. <laughs> Heterosexual. <laughs> Heterosexual, yeah. <laughs> See, haven't even used that word in so long. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, why is this here like heterosexual man 
Uh, talking about transgenderism, mm-hmm. and even in your previous book, you know, tra- talking about uh, uh, is homosexuality. Um, what is your? How do you respond? I mean, or have you yeah. faced that type of critic? Yo, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially in this day and age, you know, um, you know, it could, it's kind of like a, a white man talking about race, you know. Um, you, you're spe- well, I mean, in this day and age, being a white straight male talking about anything, you know, people say you need to sit down. You've been talking too long for centuries, and you know, and, and I <laughs> look, I, I, uh, I, um, I very much resonate with that concern. Um, uh, and I faced that when I wrote my book on homosexuality, on the Bi- Bible and homosexuality. Um, people were, I, you know, raising a question, should uh, a straight person be even talking about this? And I guess my response is, first of all, I, I, I do, if I put myself in the shoes of somebody who is LGB or, or T, um, I, I, I think I would be nervous, you know, whenever a non LGBT person talks about this because they obviously have a, um, a lack of knowledge in terms of what it, what it's like to be LGBT. Um, they lack the lived experience. And so, um, and oftentimes many straight people have gone about this conversation in a way that has been very dehumanizing, has been very detached. And so the very fact that I'm writing on this topic could be immediately triggering to, to some people. And, and, and I actually, I do, a, I understand where that can come from. I will, this, so this is why I'm really clear up front. Um, when I'm writing on this topic, I'm not writing a memoir. <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell you, here's what it's like to be gay or lesbian, or I'm not even really primarily writing to, um, well, no, I, I was, I almost said like, I'm not writing to help LGBT people, but I actually am. I'm not writing to tell them what it's like to be LGBT is, is what I wanted to say. Obviously I'm not, I'm not, I'm not writing a memoir. Like, um, there's plenty of memoirs out there too. I, I will say though, simply being, well, I, simply being gay or lesbian doesn't automatically make you an expert in a biblical theology of sex. It doesn't make you an expert in understanding the ethics of Christian uh, sexual ethics. It doesn't make you an expert in church history and how that, how the church has handled this conversation. It doesn't, you know, being trans doesn't automatically make you an expert in theological anthropology or neuroscience or psychology, you know, Um, the lived experience I think is incredibly helpful and absolutely needed. And the lived experience is something we cannot get our arms around. We cannot, um, we can't fully understand this topic without some contribution from lived experience, but simply having a lived experience doesn't make you an expert in some of the concepts that this conversation um, entails. Uh, so that that's my, my contribution is not a memoir. My contribution is I, yes, I have thought through these concepts while dialoguing and listening to many, many LGBT people. So I have tried to put relational uh, skin on, on the concepts, um, but yeah, I, I um, hopefully I've tried to understand and articulate the concepts in a way that's helpful for anybody thinking about this question. And, and lastly, I mean, my I, I've always made it clear my primary audience is Christian leaders, most of whom are not going to be gay, lesbian, tr- or trans, or bisexual. Um, and yet they are shepherding and leading and talking to and, and discipling LGBT people. So in a sense, I'm helping fellow leaders to do that Um to do that better. Um, and, and oftentimes they, they might, unfortunately they might not listen to somebody who's trans, you know? Um, wow. so I do have a, an in, I guess, with some people that, um, my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters might not get the ear of, you know? So I hope that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah makes total sense, man. Um, hopefully for people listening to, I, I know this is, this is a complex, uh, topic. Uh, I guess, the most helpful thing is don't keep out of sight that th- there's people, right? We're talking right. about real people. So, uh, and I think another really helpful thing is that at this stage, this day and age, everybody has probably one or two friends or relatives or someone that identifies as, you know, 
whichever in the spectrum of LGBTQ plus or you know, whatever, um, whatever there is, right, in terms of gender or identifying mm -hmm. yourself sexually, um, we all have somebody, right? Everybody has somebody in their life. Uh, I would, I don't know. I'm a, it's kind of like a genera generalization and assumption, but um, I think it's pretty safe to say. Yeah. Um, and I think at least I'm approaching it from that point of view. When mm -hmm. I talk about this, I know there's, I know I have people in my life that I love mm -hmm. that I would love to have at least the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Instead mm -hmm. of, uh, and, and I think this comes also to the point of, uh, you know, why do, what do Christians think or what does the Bible say about this type of things, right? And when mm -hmm. it, when you start talking about those topics, when you start, you know, being, uh, a leader of Christian leaders, I think these questions start to rise up. Well, you know, for some people it might be, well, it's it's so clear in the Bible, right? I mean, Adam and yeah. Eve, or not Adam and Steve, or <laughs> things like that, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. or Romans, or First Corinthians, mm -hmm. and 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 I think yes, it's there, but but I think it's if we just say it's there and uh, and we don't open up to at least the conversation and the possibility to to have empathy and try to understand why are people in this situation uh then we're not going to be helpful i'd say it right yeah. and we'd become just uh you know maybe a source of condemnation rather than right. a source of hope for people uh what is your experience as it relates to to that question of what does the Bible say about you no know, transgender or about like mm -hmm. this this topics of sexuality? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and and I love your I love your perspective. Like, even, I just personally, I have zero interest in just simply reinforcing people's presuppositions. I want to challenge people to think. So, even if if I think somebody might have the quote unquote, correct view on this matter. If they don't, if they know what they believe, but don't know why they believe it, um, or if they're using bad arguments or misquoting passages, or just if they don't understand the complexity of the theological conversation, then I'm, I'm not interested in just feeding their ignorance, you know, like I want people to think deeply so that they can love more widely about this topic. And, and um, yeah, so, some of the, some of the most quote unquote, biblically minded people uh, are scared of actually studying the Bible <laughs> for fear of the Bible might actually correct their presuppositions. And, and I've gotten in trouble with that quite a bit when I start challenging the why people believe what they believe. Even if I think their beliefs might, their conclusions might be generally correct. I just, um, are those conclusions based on a robust, thoughtful, humble study of God's word, or is it just absorbed from their Christian subculture. Um, that's, I think those are, that's an important question to ask. Um, what does the Bible say about trans, the trans conversation? Well, that's, I mean, that's my, my, basically my whole book, but in particular, I do, I do spend a few chapters on, on the Bible. Um, and some people think the Bible doesn't say anything. And, and if we were looking for a verse that addresses, for instance, gender dysphoria, or even like trans identities, head on, we're not going to find that verse. Uh, but we find many verses and themes in scripture that do talk about human nature and do talk about our bodies and do talk about our sexed identities. So um, probably the most significant one is Genesis 127, where it says that God created us in his image, male and female, he created them. And you see a correlation between uh, how we bear God's image and it's core that our image bearing status is correlated with not just our bodies, but our sexed bodies, male and female in Genesis 127 is clearly talking about biological sex, not the modern day concept of gender or gender identity. And throughout scripture, we see uh, a very high view of our sexed bodies Um in determining human identity. Like I do think uh, God determines whether we are male or female based on our biological sex. Um, and, uh, and yet in a fallen world, some people experience incongruence or severe incongruence between their internal sense of who they are and their biological sex. And that, that's where the, you know, um, 
the pastoral question kind of comes up, but yeah, I do. I, I do think that, um, when we look at the question of incongruence, you know, if there is this tension between somebody's internal sense of who they are and their biological sex, I will say, and then let me just little footnote. I mean, it took me, you know, five years of research and a whole 250 page book to, to kind of support what I'm about to say. So I don't want people to, I want, I, I really want to push people to think more deeply about this, but if there is an incongruence between your biological sex and internal sense of who you are, I do think the biological sex wins out. Like I do think that determines who we are, even if our psychology doesn't resonate with that. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, the, uh, that's half of what the Bible says. The other half is the Bible speaks very loudly and boldly and confrontationally about loving people who have been marginalized by religion, who have been uh, pushed to the margins by society. Uh, and for sure, trans people would fit that category in terms of, you know, um, somebody, you know, a group of people who have been marginalized, shunned, shamed, mistreated by the church. And sometimes our culture wars don't really help. So I know there's, I don't even know where we're at with the whole, you know, um, equality act or whatever, um, where they're trying to, I don't know if I want to get into that, but people know what I'm talking about. Like, I think when, when Christians get embroiled over these political debates, um, I think we oftentimes lose our affections to loving the actual people that we're ultimately talking about. So, the, and the, again, the Bible talks a lot about, uh, that kind of posture. Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, at the risk of of being canceled at some point, <laughs> I want to I want to tell a story. You know, and this is this is me in my early teens or almost like preteens in Mexico. Mexico. I mean, uh, I remember there's there's this spot in the city that was used to know to be known as the you know, if you want to find kind of like this, this, this people that offer their bodies, but uh, is is not really a woman. It's it's a guy dressed as a woman, right, or a mm. a, a man who believes he's a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, there was like this specific area where they would be, and I remember for whatever reason, you know, I, I guess I don't know. It was culturally, it was way different. It's a different country. Uh, many years ago, you know, I'm 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 gonna be 40 this year, so <laughs> that's like 30 30 years ago or so. Uh, I remember people would drive by that place and mock, mm. you know, the 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 women that were there, mm. you know, the, it, throw all kinds of slurs or you know, just all kinds of ugly words or whatever, right? Just uh, making fun of them, and you know, I guess as 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 I think back a little bit of, uh, about this conversation we're having right now, and we were when we were actually in society 30 years ago, like doing this type of things, I do realize, man, we are broken, right? How broken are we that mm. at least in that era, we used to think, oh, it's okay to do this, right? It's okay to mock people for 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 doing things that just seem outrageous to us right or weird or whatever it might be and now i think i love what you're saying about yes scripture says this thing but it also says to love the marginalized mm -hmm. to love the outcast mm -hmm. what a different approach it would it would have been at least for me right if instead of mocking people you offer something positive right mm -hmm. And, or just, I mean, just start to try to be at least helpful in the conversation. I don't know if at 13 I could have been uh, very conversational, but I think it's just the attitude of the heart, you know, that now I feel like something's shifted or changed in me where I feel like, man, that's that's just so wrong. <laughs> you know, even if you disagree with yeah. how people live their lives, it's like, can we at least talk about it, right? Can we at least try to find out why they have this, I, I guess the, 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 the correct word or the psychological word is gender dysphoria, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and understand that there might be something more psychologically going on in their minds than just, than just uh, right, the physical sex, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't approach this with love first, 
I think we're going to be lost. And I think you said it well in your book. Um, and I don't have pages because I was just listening to it. But somewhere in that, you said, if we get the Bible right and love wrong, we are wrong. Yeah. And I would love to say, or I guess as you said that phrase, I said, wow, it's almost like, can I say, if we get the Bible right and love wrong, we're not getting the Bible right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that mocking point, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've never met anybody who was kind of mocked into the kingdom of God. Like they were mocked so hard and then they said, wow, I really want to join the religion that this mocker is, you know, a part of. Like I've never met that person. Um, but, you know, my Bible says <laughs> in Romans 2, 4, that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And so if we truly want people to repent, um, then we should be all the more kind. Um, there's, there should be no place for, for mocking. And oftentimes when, you know, the, going back to your illustration with that scenario, like you see this, you know, this, the, this group of people, you know, living in debauchery or, you know, oppression or, you know, who, we have to ask the question, how, how did they get there? You know what? Like if you actually sat down and, and listened to one of those those person's stories for an hour, what, what do you think that story would look like? You know, um, I doubt they had, you know, just a, an amazing upbringing and all, you know, all this, you know, great loving parents and, you know, and then they just woke up one day and decided to go sell themselves on the streets. Like that rarely is the case. Like usually there's a lot of pain and oppression and sometimes abuse or stuff that, you know, if anybody went through would probably end up in the same place. So it really is the, the epitome of being a judgmental Pharisee um, to simply show up and mock them and drive off. And, and that what's hard is, you know, I, as my, in, to bring it back to politics, like I, I do see a growing interest among Christians in the kind of uh, political wars in our country and whichever side you are on, um, if you pay if you give your allegiance to one side or the other, or listen to this political commentator or that political commentator, typically they stoke these fires in our souls that want to mock and be outraged and, and accuse the other person. And we, again, when we have that posture, when we get sucked into these political wars, then I think we end up losing the Christ-like affections that we're supposed to have towards people who are often caught in the middle of these uh, political wars. And that's, uh, it's as a church, we, we've got a golden opportunity right now to do it differently, to embody both the truth and grace of Jesus and not get sucked into the, the polarized, uh, co culture that we are living in right now. Yes. I love that, man. I think, um, you know, I, I feel like I almost want to tell some of my friends, you know, who are super conservative, I'm like, man, I, I almost feel like I agree with your conservative side, mm -hmm. but your approach, man, it's it's not going to invite any conversation. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. repeal people. It doesn't have anything. It doesn't have any grace. It doesn't have, it's not showing any kindness. It's not bringing any help, anything helpful to the conversation. It's just mm -hmm. almost just like a blunt, I disagree, <laughs> right? And, and And I feel like, to tell some of those conservative people, maybe listening, I don't even know if, if there's a, no, that, that much of a conservative, I would assume, you know, cause there's people listening around the world, but uh, if you're conservative, we're not saying we either agree or disagree. I think, I think this is, uh, we're just trying to be helpful with, with, even if we agree, you know, if you mm -hmm. just have a standpoint where you say everybody else is wrong, that's not gonna bring, about a solution to yeah. any issue, you no, know, whatever the issue might yeah. be. But in this case, I think uh, even if you have this stance that no, I believe the Bible is right, right, in, in terms of sexuality and like all this, like almost like moral dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more helpful to approach it with a with a humble heart, right, with an openness, like you said, you know, to think more more widely. Mm -hmm. um, because ultimately love wins, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 how you bring people into the 
into the into the kingdom. I think you said it. Um, let yeah. me see if I can find it here. Yeah, yeah as you said, as you're looking, I want to really quick clarify that. Yeah, my I would say my values in terms of even politics and society would definitely lean more conservative. Uh, and about, my, my main concern is when we give more allegiance or affection to a particular p political tribe. Um, not that we can't vote a certain way or even resonate maybe with the values of one side or the other, but in this day and age, both sides um, that are fighting this culture war are, are producing so much outrage in people's hearts, and that's the, where the danger lies. I, I think Christians should have a healthy, measured, humble, forthright response to unbiblical worldviews that are um, trickling down and, and, and invading the church. Absolutely. We should pay attention to stuff going on and deconstruct and respond, but, but do so with a posture that's not just outraged, but is embodying the same kindness of God that leads to repentance. So, sorry, you, you were finding a quote. <laughs> I found it, man. It says, the greatest apologetic for truth is love. Mm. I love that, man. And I again, right, this is my first Audible book that I listen to. So it's different because normally I'm highlighting things and <laughs> yeah. I just go back to the pages. But in this case, I got to like listen and then like, oh, I got to type this because it's so good. <laughs> the greatest, the greatest, listen to it again and, and almost like pause and listen mm -hmm. to that. The greatest apologetic for truth is love, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's, And I think that's embodied in how Jesus lived. I mean, Jesus is the perfect example of of the greatest apologetics of truth and he lived the light of a life of love. Um I want to talk about a little bit of the the parenting side or the parenting conversation um of 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 this topic because I mean, you talk about this uh again, you know, I I almost like got a little bit um there's so much terminology, but there's one where you said, I think it's called CTR or CHT. CHT. Mm. Can you say, well, first, can you say what is CHT and why is there like a, like this, this uh, rising in teenagers who are, who are trying to undergo, you know, a, a transformation of their bodies? So CHT stands for a cross sex hormone therapy which is one of the stages of uh, transitioning. <clears throat> and uh, when we talk about transitioning, you know, from one biological sex to, to be more precise, I would say to the appearance of the other biological sex, um, because you can't, at least right now, we don't have the technology to truly change biological sexes. I mean, our biological sex is etched into the code of every single cell in our body. So we can't right now, <laughs> to, uh, maybe in the future, um, you know, change that, but we can change from one appearance to the other. And CHT cross sex hormone therapy is one significant way to do that. So if you're, um, I mean, if you're a biological male, you have much higher levels of testosterone and lower levels of estrogen, though, though you do have some estrogen than, than females. Um, but we can alter that. We can reduce your testosterone and elevate your estrogen. And that will have major effects on your body. It will, give you a more feminizing appearance and same thing for biological female females taking uh, testosterone. Now where, and that's a whole other conversation, whether this is helpful or good or ethical and all that, where I am deeply concerned is, and I have a whole chapter in the book on this is uh, younger teenagers going through this kind of medicalization because younger teenagers are younger teenagers. Our, our brains aren't fully developed until we're 24, 25 years old. Uh, teenagers are going through all kinds of things, especially figuring out who they are and identity crises sometimes. We know that teenagers today uh, have much, much higher levels of anxiety, depression, uh, suicidality, uh, mental health concerns. And so to take a teenager and, and perform irreversible medicalization on them, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that, especially when the medicalization does seem to be ideologically driven. I mean, what I mean by that is there is this, I would say, very unscientific uh, assumption that 
you know, if a nine-year-old or 12-year-old or 15-year-old says they're trans, then that's who they are. That's who they always will be. This is innate. This is etched into the fabric of their humanity. And it's like, no, it's not. It's just not. Like, according to all the scientific studies done, you know, 61 to 88% of children with gender dysphoria, it ends up going away after puberty. And we know that gender dysphoria is, is hard to pin down. It can come in waves. It can come, it can go. And so, so no, identifying as trans is not like some in a, you know, never ending identity that will always be there. So it just doesn't make any, not just biblical stuff. I mean, I'm not even getting into the Bible yet, but I mean, it doesn't make any scientific or even human sense to permanently medicalize a teenager um, that will have irreversible effects on them. If, you, if you're on cross-sex hormones for more than 18 months, typically you're uh, infertile for life. So if you end up growing out of that identity or, or maybe that's a ch changing that identity and realizing, no, I'm not trans. I'm actually uh, non-trans, you know, and, and yeah, I do want to get married. I do want to have kids. Well, that, that decision has been taken from you by a medical professional who has been, um, I, I would say uh, for his, for ideological interests, not, not because the science says no, every single teenager who identifies as trans who wants hormones should go on hormones. Like, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge debate. And when I say debate, it's debated among very liberal non-Christian um, psychologists and medical professionals who are like, this is not okay. It's like people who are totally fine with an adult saying, I want to transition, you know, it's like, hey, it's free country, do what you want. Um, but 15 year olds don't have the, the ability to make this kind of irreversible decision. Um, so yeah, I think parents need to be deeply of, I think parents need to be very aware that this is, this is a huge thing going on in, in society right now, especially if you are a parent of young teens who, I mean, even if you're like, well, my kid's not trans. Well, not yet. I mean, <laughs> there's been a 5,000% increase among female teenagers in the United Kingdom coming out as trans, like almost overnight, like with no prior history of gender dysphoria. So even if you're, you think your kid, oh, they're not gender dysphoric. They act like a boy. They act like a girl and they are a boy or girl. Um, anything can happen when, when they become a teenager. So being aware is the best, um, the best way to be able to shepherd your kids. Well, if, if they come out as trans or if their friends do, and they start asking questions about this, because this is, this is, this is serious stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you say it's, um, gender ideology. Um, to me, it's super interesting because I'm a, I'm a communications guy. And sometimes I feel like, okay, what well, it's almost like this, this, uh, question of what comes first the egg or the chicken uh, so when i look at culture and when i look at you know disney plus or netflix and things like this like movies we watch and it starts showcasing you know uh two women kissing or things like that right where i'm like okay is that is that creating culture or is that just portraying what our society looks like right now Mm. Right. So in a sense, I feel like, uh, I don't know, or maybe it's both. Maybe it's uh, it's a little bit of, no, at the same time that it's showcasing it, it's almost like opening up the possibility for people to think about, oh, maybe I can do the same, right? Maybe I can, you know, if I have this dysphoria, maybe I should lean more into that. I don't know. I feel like almost like when, uh, if you have choices, yeah. you're going to take them, right? I would say that, yeah, with teenagers today, and this is, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, um, politically incorrect maybe, but uh, not even politically incorrect. It's, it's disputed, but everything in this conversation is disputed. So I, I just talk about whatever and let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> um, it's a big, you know, touchy suggestion to say that, uh, culture might play some role in influencing somebody's uh, either gender identity or sexual identity. Well, guess what? Nature and nurture are very blurry. Uh, our sexuality is very complicated. Gender identity is very, very complicated. There's debates about what that even is. So yes, of course, there's the possibility, I'll just leave it at that, that culture is on some level influencing people's sexual exploration and or sexual or gender identity 
when it comes to gender identity, I would say without a doubt with younger kids, culture is playing a role, a role. I'm not saying that, you know, biological, psychological tendencies aren't there as well, but I think culture is for sure, for sure playing a role. Um, this is why I think we have such a, a rise in uh, even bisexual identities. Um, every other teenage girl today, I feel like, I mean, I think statistically it's very, very unprecedented number of teenage females who identify as bisexual or pansexual, which is largely the same thing. It just comes with a different ideology on what it means to be human. Um, and, and again, going back to the trans identity, what does it mean to be trans? Uh, it could be anything from like, I'm a girl and I want to cut my hair short and color it blue. Um, and I don't feel very feminine to, I have severe gender dysphoria and I can't leave the house, you know, because I feel like I'm inside somebody else's body. Like there's, again, it could be trans covers all that stuff. So, um, yeah, there, there's all kinds of different reasons why somebody might explore bisexuality, um, especially in a culture that not only is okay with it, but might even encourage encourage it or, or might even interpret. Sometimes emotional feelings are over-interpreted. So like in, in some contexts today, if you're a female and have some kind of admiration of another female, our culture will push you to interpret those feelings sexually even though wow every i mean we could you and i i mean we could be straight as an arrow and still look at a guy with a good body and say dang i wish i had those abs you know that doesn't mean we're attracted to him sexually it just means that like you could admire somebody's body or even be jealous of somebody's body or even have an emotional a non-sexual emotional attachment to another human and in this day and age it's like either it's like the only category that exists or the main category is a sexual category. So I think teenagers are for sure being, are, aren't even being helped in how to interpret their own emotional responses. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think culture is playing wow. a role. Yeah. And uh, just for uh, Preston, for people that are listening and just kind of like incentivize them to, to get the book, to read the book. I love it. The, there's this, this part in the book where you talk about, Mr. KD, <laughs> man, I was, I, I mean, I was listening to it and you talk about like this KD falling in love or, or not really falling in love, but having like this really good friend and who <laughs> he said, oh man, this, this guy, I love him almost more than I love women. And he happened to be in the Bible and some people some people utilizing this passage to say, man, you see, it's right there, right? Oh, uh, yeah. no, we, we can love another guy. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> well, just go check it out guys. Cause it's a, I mean, it's a tremendous book on the conversation, the, the whole conversation about gender identity, the whole conversation about, you no, know, what does it mean to be transgender, which, I mean, it really comes down to when there's a transgender, that's just one transgender, right? The, it, it can't be more than that, but it's such a helpful uh, book and conversation for something that, like Preston's saying, um, we, we need to talk about it. You know, we need to be aware. We need to, uh, even somewhere in the book, you mentioned that I think Iran is the country with more uh, transition operations. So, I mean, this is a global phenomenon in a sense. And I think as Christians, we, we, I, I rather face like full on the subjects and say, okay, let's talk about it rather than trying to catch up with culture and see, oh, you know, no, culture is, is scary. Let's not talk about it. We got to do, you know, we got to do it right now. So, it's a super helpful resource. There's so much uh, scientific uh, uh, research, I would say, you know, into like even the terminology. Uh, there's data, there's statistics, um, super informational. But I think after all, it also comes down to to a heart issue. You know, how are we going to respond as Christians? And even uh, I don't even want you to answer these questions. I, I just want to say that it's in the book. Uh, you know, for example, the of course, if you're going to talk about transgender from a, you know, almost like a biblical scholar, one of the questions is, can a trans or should a Christian um, 
no convert or what what do you call it transition right to mm -hmm. the christian transition you know to to your gender identity uh, i don't want you to answer it man because i want people really to to wrestle with it mm -hmm. and to go to the book maybe as a resource um but maybe to to wrap it up man how do you want to end like what's what's a helpful um what's a yeah what's helpful for to wrap up this conversation what mm -hmm. yeah no it's great I, i i mean i think it's just what you've been talking about like i i, I do think all christians in this day and age um need need to think um need to need to set aside some time in your life to think better about this topic and don't just rely on your favorite political pundit to be the expert in your life. Um, and I, look, I honestly, I, one of the things I hate doing is promoting my own stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> But so, it's good. I, well, I hate, I really did. There's too much of that going on. So I don't want to do that. I will say I wrote this book because I didn't, I wasn't satisfied with the other uh, books out there. I, I, there's, and there's good, there's books out there that, that, contribute to the conversation in helpful ways. Um, there were certain questions that I felt like still needed to be asked and answered. Um, and I think the Bible needs to be, um, thought through more, more critically. So, um, yeah. So if, uh, so yeah, I, I would encourage you to read my book, but not because it's my book, but because I, I do think it's a helpful overview of the conversation. But if you're like, no, I want to read a different book, then read a different book. Like, like go just, just make sure you engage this conversation thoughtfully so that you can love people better. Um, I don't, in 2021, I don't think silence is an option for any thinking Christian who wants to be, um, to, who wants to be a help, a helpful discipler, whether you're discipling your kids, people at church, whether you're a leader, a youth pastor, whatever, like you just, you cannot, maybe five years ago, you can get by <laughs> and, and ignore this conversation. But it's, I would say this might be slightly too strong, but probably not. Um, I think it's a, a little irresponsible really to uh, try to disciple people well in the West, in America, you know, um, without engaging this conversation to some extent, because um, this is something that most younger people, especially are really thinking through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Um, a lot of young people are thinking through, and I think, you know, part of this, uh, um, just kind of to end on this, Part of my my goal with Christian podcast is really to be a resource almost for for like the global south. And I was talking mm. a, a little bit about this topic with Dan Coke, where we were saying how uh, I mean, long story, but basically the Western world still holds like the the reins on on the power and the resources when it comes mm. to to Christianity and conversation, even though the global South mm -hmm. has more Christians now in the world, right? Yeah, so totally. <laughs> so I feel like I wanna, I almost like wanna bridge the two, you know, me with my Mexican background, you know, coming mm -hmm. from Latin America. And, and I know that a lot of what happens in America or even in, you know, America, Europe, uh, England, uh, a lot of what happens here replicates maybe because of you no know, its cultural uh implications right with movies and mm -hmm. and uh tv shows or whatever it replicates in the world you know so even mm -hmm. as when i look at like my facebook page and i see you know like women rising and saying oh you know we want this is in mexico right uh women like today or like this week i think it's maybe today but there's a march of women in the capital of Mexico mm -hmm. who are saying, hey, we want to be treated differently. You know, we mm -hmm. I think we deserve almost like kind of like what, what happened here in the U.S., you know, a few years ago. Right. Uh, yeah. No, we why are we getting why are we making less money than a man? Right. If mm -hmm. we, we put the same effort we put. So I feel like a lot of what happens here replicates in yeah. the world. So I feel like this is such a helpful conversation because I know. Mm -hmm. It might take you no know, a couple of years, but at mm -hmm. some point in Latin America in the global south, we're gonna be asking the question, yeah. oh man, how do I love well a, a trans person, right? Or how mm -hmm. do I love well a LGBTQ? So I think uh, not only is this a great resource for the 
for the Western world, I think it's yeah. a great resource for the global church in yeah. engaging in this conversation and saying, man, we we got to maybe do a better job at understanding what the issue is and understanding that mm -hmm. there's people behind it. And ultimately, yeah. if we're Christians, I think to understand that, well, I don't know if we can understand it because it comes from the heart, but it's transformational when we really love people. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's also that sense of where we, we are also discipling people. So how can we do that lovingly and do it well yeah. and and do it with a, from a standpoint of empathy? So yeah, I, I guess that's my conclusion. Do you want to say anything else? Do you want to point people to you know where they can get the book or your website or your resources? Because yeah. I know you also have a... a a podcast, which is phenomenal. So I also have it on christianpodcast.com if people want to find it. There's that, but uh, yeah. no, I want to point people to. So yeah, I run a ministry called the Center for Faith, Sex, Body, and Gender. So centerforfaith.com. And we do have resources in Spanish. Um, uh, the e-resources they can download at centerforfaith.com. Um, and yeah, my podcast, Theology in the Raw, twice a week, free podcast. I uh, have uh we talk a lot about lots of things, but sexuality and gender is maybe 30% of the time. I feel like I have a guest on talking about that, talk a lot about race and so on. And um, yeah, yeah, I love your point about the, 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 for good or for ill, you know, the influence of the West on, on the world. Um, I, I would say in this conversation too, there's other cultures that are actually further ahead or, um, you know, a trans related identity um, has been at home in that culture for many years. I mean, I know the, in Thailand and Southeast Asia, Philippines, even South Pacific. Um, it, it, I think Latin America, I'm not, I, I've never been um, to South America, but I think Brazil, I, I, I don't think this is a yet to come conversation. I think it's very much something that Christians there are wrestling with. I think India or Nepal might have been the first country to recognize a third sex or gender on their passport or whatever. So yeah, this, this is... Um, Many sexuality conversations are kind of the the West is kind of the 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 ones kind of out in the head of, head of culture. But I think when it comes to gender and trans related conversations, cultures have been kind of all over all over the place on that. So, yeah, very relevant for anybody. So good. Well, Preston, appreciate you so much, man. Thank you for being on the show. This is helpful. I love your book, man. I love reading it. And also, I just wanna, I guess, man, I never want to end, but. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to end on this uh, as my first experience listening to an audiobook. It was so great that it was actually you reading the yeah. book. I'm like, oh, this is cool, man. It was almost like listening to a podcast, like I said, you know, yeah. for like five hours or so. But so good, man. So good. Highly recommend to people. Preston, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, bro. Bye. La speranza è il futuro.